It is a great day, man. It is. Happy New Year. In with the new year, marijuana legalization has come to California. And with it, a lot of money. This is a new industry. Just how big a deal is this? It's ginormous. It's bigger than I can even explain. And is California ready? There's still a lot of work to be done. From the worries and doubts. Is the illicit market to continue to thrive? To the hopes and dreams. You know, it's exciting and scary all at the same time. How Prop 64 is going to work. No, it messed things up even worse or how it's supposed to work. Is it going to be cost effective at this size? And, and I like to think so. Because ready or not, the green rush is on. <sighs> we're sitting on about $2 million worth of product at all times. What we're seeing now is the entire world is watching California. This is wonderful. <laughs> Good evening, Happy New Year, and thank you for being with us as we take stock of this landmark day for California and the country. This is history in the making. And it all started this morning. <laughs> yes, the big headline, adults 21 and older can now buy marijuana for recreational use. But beyond the novelty and genuine historical significance of today's sales, there is just so much more to this. I think I'm always worried about, you know, the things that we haven't accounted for, the things that we haven't thought of. Commonly referred to as California's marijuana czar, Lori Ajax is overseeing the launch of a fleet of rules governing absolutely everything about this plant, from the moment it's put in the dirt to the moment it's consumed, and all of this is being done on the fly. In fact, this is technically an emergency. We had to have our regulations finalized, so the statute allowed us to have uh, emergency regulations in place. So now that California has fired up the legalized market, what happens next comes down to a few burning questions. We can't issue a license um, at the state level if it's going to violate a city or county ordinance. Question one, cities and counties get to choose their own destiny, so who and how many will say yes. Oakland has been waiting for this for years. San Jose has also jumped on board, claiming a unique cannabis distinction. In my hand is the first state license ever issued by California. And then there's San Francisco, where a bitter fight at City Hall created a delay in the permitting process. Uh, we're looking at the fifth at the absolute earliest from the way I understand it. We're ready. Uh, we're just waiting on everybody else. But the rest of the Bay Area will begin the year largely dry or with a grab bag of assorted laws. And a good example of this is Sonoma County. Uh, only two cities allow for adult use. Those two cities, Sebastopol and Katati, while right across the street in Rohnert Park, city leaders have banned all sales. And while the county also won't allow sales, it will allow cultivation. But there is more to this economy than just growing and selling. This is a sour diesel. This is kind of the lighter terpenes that come off early with less temperature. Just within the city limits of Santa Rosa, Dennis Hunter has built the largest cannabis manufacturing operation in the United States. So this one is an Emerald Cup um, brand. Really, if you are consuming a marijuana concentrate right now, it was very likely produced at Canacraft, and legalization, obviously, is good news here. It's the end of us looking over our shoulder I'm wondering if uh, our doors are going to get kicked in. But Hunter is not convinced it will mean a flood of new customers. I definitely think that we're going to see more, but um, I don't think it will be like fivefold. And that's question number two. Just what kind of marijuana appetite does the state have? Is there really a large group of Californians ready to start using marijuana now that it's legal? And will customers want something good or something cheap? Generally, we're letting people know that they can expect 10 to 30 percent higher prices with the, with the taxes. So I have state taxes on it, you have the excise tax, you have a cultivation tax, and then you get the local jurisdictions putting their own tax on it, and then you have your regular sales tax. But assuming there will be some increased use, we're faced with the same health and safety questions raised during the Prop 64 campaign. The message today, DUI doesn't just mean booze. Now, the Highway Patrol is training officers to spot stoned drivers, and health experts are sounding alarms. And the public health perspective was really completely absent in, in the, among the people who were putting the money up and controlling the process of writing the initiative. Childproof packaging. But some health concerns were baked into the new law, namely in regard to quality control. In a regulated environment, all roads lead through testing. 
which means now is a very good time to be working at Steep Hill Labs in Oakland. It's also a good time to be in the business of selling or installing liquid chromatographs because the state simply does not have the capacity to test all that product. This is necessitating a rapid expansion for our capacity. We need more square footage, more equipment, more people. We're, we're staffing up rapidly. Not rapidly enough. The state is delaying testing requirements because building out that testing capacity could easily take another year. This is a complicated industry. Uh, the equipment that's required is incredibly complex. The, the staffing that is required is a, uh, requires a high level uh, of expertise and scientific training. Triple quadruple mass spectrometer. So you start to get an idea of just how expensive it will be to start a business in this industry and how complicated it's going to be for entrepreneurs and governments to make it work. We, we can't move it. We have to have a distributor come and pick it up and move it over here. It says there's so many more moving parts. That's one reason your city, town, or county may be sitting this out for now, waiting to see how things shake out. But things can always get more complicated. Kicked in all the interior doors, came in with uh, assault rifles. How the new law is already creating winners, losers, and vastly different fortunes in neighboring counties. It's a money play. It's about the money. We'll give you a tour of what cutting edge cannabis looks like. We happen to be the only lead certified that we know of and aware of in the um, United States. And we'll check in with the folks who might have the most to lose with legalization. You know, everybody says, what are we going to lose, what are we going to gain? It's kind of like the, the crux of it there. How the Emerald Triangle is bending and hoping not to break as the green rush continues. You're ready to go. We're ready to go. Uh, we were issued our adult recreational use license yesterday, so crazy last minute stuff for us. So we've looked at how the new law is supposed to work, how an industry is racing to adapt and expand, and how the Bay Area is slowly moving in to this green rush, but for a deeper dive into how California's new laws are creating some turbulent waters, let's head south to a city that is diving right in. You know, it's all moving so fast that it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's like paddling out on a big day. It's 10 foot overhead. That big wave analogy is Adam Knopf's way of describing his ride at uh, Golden yeah, State Greens. Yeah, we, we see about six, 800 people a day. Back of house, just as epic. <sighs> We're sitting on about $2 million worth of product at all times. And all of this works as a cooperative. It's 100 plus employees have full health care and it's been playing by the state's new rules for months. Same goes for the cannabis testing facility right across the street. So when it comes to getting ready for today, there may be no city as well prepared as San Diego. We're, we're really proud of our city. Um, they've taken the bull by the horns and really stepped up and, um, you know, before San Francisco and L.A. The voters overwhelmingly supported it and they want the use to occur. Let's figure out a way to, to make it work because it's going to happen nonetheless. City Council Member Chris Kate knows there will be challenges, but he says the best option given the tide of the industry was get on board. I think we have, and I think the, I think the reason we, we've, we are trying to do that is because we want to be innovative. And we understand that there's going to be give and take, especially with how to regulate this business moving forward for the fact that we've never done it before. So who helped craft San Diego's cutting edge cannabis laws? We lobbied at the highest levels if need be and tried to help the city themselves understand the industry. Which means Golden State Greens is in a very nice position to do very well. And the same can be said for one man just up the road in what could soon become the largest legal marijuana market on the face of the earth. Uh, you're in South LA, we're on Century Boulevard. It's really a good neighborhood. All the violence didn't calm down. Meet Donnie Anderson. This is my, where I grew up, born and raised at. The former music industry executive is now shaping Los Angeles marijuana policy, which is basically to start recreational sales within the existing medical dispensaries like his own. Thank you for coming, man. Enjoy. Now, one day he'd also like to grow and distribute his own brand. Our product is California cannabis. But for now, whether it's his shop in South LA or say a medical dispensary in West Hollywood, existing licensed businesses have a huge head start on whatever is coming next. You're gonna see big money in here by the third year. And you're gonna see them trying to buy every business out. 
because they want this industry. But if you keep traveling north, right over the grapevine, you'll find something entirely different. They came in uh, like Call of Duty style, helmets, jackets, assault rifles. All the interior doors of the building were kicked in. After five years in business, Dave Abbasi's Bakersfield Collective is now effectively out of business. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product. And to be sure, Kern County is a more conservative slice of California. Prop 64 failed here by seven points, and Abbasi says city and county lawmakers use that to justify a crackdown. Yes, they did. They said, you know, we're going to ban adult use, but they also banned medical. So as recreational use dawns in some areas, buying any kind of legal cannabis in Bakersfield is getting more difficult. But that doesn't mean Kern County will be entirely dry. And they're going to want this brand to be the blue chip brand. Remember Donnie Anderson's plan to take his business vertical? We have the trademark for this. We don't have it for what's in it. He needs a place to grow that California cannabis. And guess where he's going to do it? We have a cultivation license in California City already, which is next to uh, Bakersfield. We have a 20-acre property up there. So the Los Angeles Kern County line becomes an interesting spot on this new landscape. You have two entirely different marijuana policies, and yet these two counties could be heading towards what you might call a marijuana business partnership. Because We got the uh, land out there for cheap. It's only an hour and 50 minutes away. But it's not just that odd neighborly phenomenon. Think of all the complexities this presents across California. It's kind of a wild ride at this point. A wild ride that's already reaching down to California's marijuana roots. For so long, we was getting our flowers from Emerald Triangle all up that way. And that, of course, will take us north to where it all started. Now we started the movement to come out to these hills and grow something that was really good and not just coming across the border from Mexico years ago. Mm -hmm. We'll look at how the new laws are causing a sea change in the Emerald Triangle. You know, right now it's a, it's a really difficult transition for a lot of people. And we'll try to look into the future. If they overtax it, they're going to turn people back to the black market. What will probably go wrong before it goes right and where we may be five years from now when the green rush continues. Worth noting that California has a long, colorful history with marijuana. Today's big change, just the latest chapter in that story. But what is going to happen to the men and women who really started this revolution back when it meant risking a prison sentence? A lot's going to change, for sure. But the one thing that I really hope that we don't lose, especially up here in the hills where it's the home of cannabis in America, is um, the, the vibe. Deep in the hills that protected this industry for generations, growing marijuana now means something no farmer wants to deal with. You know, nobody ever became a farmer because they wanted to do paperwork. We're no longer a couple of old hippies living in the mountains growing pot, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, we still are, but and now, you know, people have investors and boards and responsibilities to that. And so it's just a whole new different ball game. But Nikki and Swami of Swami Select and Casey O'Neill of Happy Day Farms, a couple small, above-board medicinal growers I've been following for years, and they'll tell you, legalization has not come easy. The regulations are very complex. There's a lot of different layers to them. There's a lot of requirements. The plants they grow in the summer, well, they have to be packaged by a licensed distributor, moved by a licensed transporter, and meet countless other requirements that fall under some 11 different state and local agencies. And that is already driving people out of the business. Around July or August, we started hearing from people that have been growing for many years saying, We've done the math, it's over, we can't afford it, it doesn't make any sense. Now some farmers will just retreat deeper into the woods, but others will give up altogether, and that raises an even larger concern here, the fate of communities that now depend on these small farmers. You know, on the individual level, obviously, it's very important for me to see this work if I'm going to be successful, but on the sort of more societal level, it's like, you know, this is, this is a, a fulcrum that drives uh, rural economies a lot of the time. And so we need to make sure that we get this right. And that brings us to one concern we've heard across the state from almost everyone involved with this new economy. Regulations are good. It gives you control. But at the same time, if you overregulate and overtax it, then you defeat the purpose as well. The problem that we have right now is that the state and city see money and they want to overtax. 
watch, you know, regulated cannabis just become way more expensive than what people can find on the black market. So how do you beat the black market? We're going to definitely need some policing on the back end uh, from the state as well. That's why you'll probably see licensed sellers happily pointing fingers at unlicensed competitors. KML right here, Wellness Center, unlicensed shop, and they're everywhere. Not only could the high price of doing legal business fuel the black market, it could also make this an exclusive industry for players with a lot more capital. I know multiple companies that's already vested in this, big, big boys, that's already invested. They just under the table. So even among those trying to make a go of this industry, there are doubts. I think over the next year, you're going to see some changes. I think you're going to see us even looking at our regulations and maybe looking at making some changes on things that don't work. And you're probably going to see some legislation uh, coming out this next year. The first year likely to be a little chaotic, but eventually things should settle down. I could see this riding this wave out till about 2019 in regards to the dust settling. Three years from now? I think there will be some people that will, will do really well and there will be some people that won't make it. Uh, let's say five years. Five years is a different industry. Now it's, it's Fortune 500. And while we have focused largely on economics tonight, there is certainly more to this than money. You've got to always remember. People are not going to go to jail over this anymore, right. yeah. and people are going to get medicine who would not have it, because I truly believe it is medicine. Yeah. And maybe, just maybe, it'll even work for the small farmers who stuck their neck out for this plant long before January 1st, 2018. To me, it's, it's so much bigger than like, well, you know, some hippies want to grow some weed. It's about this question of like, what do we value for 21st century agriculture? And let's figure out how to make this work for 50,000 small farms rather than 500 big ones. One last thought for all of the adults in the room, those of you 21 years of age and older, what this all means for you, whether or not it is for you, is now up to you. It is your choice. And wasn't that the idea? Thank you for being with us. Much more on California's Green Rush on our website. We'll be right back.